Disruptors and Curious Minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we talk about the people disrupting systems, the people on the that have their eyes on the future of where we are headed, not where we are. But we are deeply rooted in the foundational principles of humans, of society, of all that stuff. And we try to connect it all, right? Um, my name's Jeremy. This is Mark. We're happy to be here. We are we have a little pivot today. We're doing a little pivot today, which is which is great because this this uh, yeah we we like to be flexible. Mark, uh, what do we have going on today? Well, yeah, we were going to be speaking about scaling tech startups with Yeah Kleeper, um, but he's scaled his startups so well and so efficiently and so incredibly awesomely that he can't actually be here today because one of the protocols that he's funding is called the lava network and they're doing a a, an airdrop token launch at the moment and just doesn't have the the bandwidth here which is a bit disappointing because i've heard about lava but i don't really understand what it is i was looking forward to learning more about um incentive pools for blockchains so so we like talking about incentives we were going to be talking about incentives on the blockchain so we'll be saving the conversation for another day you like incentives so don't you jeremy yeah i mean you got to incentivize the behaviors that you want to see happen right it's it's like a it's back to the innate things that, that we talked about earlier but yeah no yeah just a mere main main net launch you know token launch you know nothing really big you know as far as effort goes today for for our our friend the, but the more the more we talk about blockchain though and just for new listeners we don't just talk about blockchain ai quantum biotech robotics all of the good stuff but often talk about blockchain and the conversation seems to always come back to incentives. And the more conversations we have about the blockchain, the more that trust and incentives seem to play such big parts of it. Trust and incentives. Yeah. Those are, those are two big things, right? You know, are you, are you trusting the system you intend to participate and add value to? And is there clear value coming back to you for your effort and, and that sort of thing? I think it's really interesting. That's why the, those technologies are so interesting to me because they're rooted in you know these these human centric tendencies and behaviors, right? Yeah, there's, there's this human layer of what drives our motivations, and then the technology can provide um, well can can being has the, the potential word, to has the potential to that's right. This, calcified one way one way tickets that's right yeah we want to get the round trips going um speaking of round trips we're going to give you a trip round a book today yeah. uh, we're giving you guys a taste of what we do in book club and um we've been through a bunch of different books we are actually at the at the finish line of this book called the order of time by carlo Rivelli. Um, we tried to get Carlo on the show. He is busy figuring out time and the biggest pieces of the world. Uh, he did respond, which we were very excited about. And we were going to continue to try and uh, talk to him about this. But this was a suggestion from one of our guests, right, that, that we jumped in to read. It was Shiti Mahangani, the CEO of Stepan. And actually, we've spoken to all the authors except for Shane Parrish, I think, of um, Clear Thinking. We read Clear Thinking, but we've done... The, the design of everyday things. Of course, we had Don Norman on a few weeks ago. We have the Nexus. We had Julio Otino on. Um, what else have we done? Clear thinking. Yeah, no Shane Parrish yet, Shane. Not the yet. And Shane, and Shane, we're actually going to tie your ideas and thoughts in your book, Clear Thinking, to this last chapter. You and Carlo Are Rivelli... We? You and Carlo Rivelli should really hang out, man. That would be a, that would be an outstanding... We should have them both on the show and talk. Well, the next best thing, if we can't have them both on the show, is that they have their own show between them. You know, these big, big minds collide, and at least that we could say good one. we were responsible a tiny little bit for for that. Okay, how are you going to link Shane Parrish and Clear Thinking into the order of time? I think I know where the the link is, but I'm interested to hear. Well, let's let's yeah let's 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 kind of tiptoe into that one. Let's tiptoe into that one. But we're in. So we've got two chapters left in this book, right? Uh, chapter thirteen, the source of time, and that the little the little piece at the end that he kind of tries to wrap it up uh, in chapter fourteen, the sister of sleep, which kind of scares me, but kind of like makes me feel good at the same time, which which is which is interesting. What were your um? As we wrap up this book, let's let's talk about thirteen and fourteen, but let's let's also tie some overall thoughts into like what this book 
did for our brains as it melted them uh, in various points and particles uh, throughout our process. What talk about source of time? What did, what did you land on, Mark? What did you what did you well, find? In the, the TLDR essentially, it's the TLDR of the book, and the TL the too long didn't read is he outlines what he did in the book, and essentially the first half of the book he deconstructs this idea of time that we have, and he he uses physics. Um, which I like the sentence that physics helps us penetrate layers of the mystery. So he uses physics to break down, you know, time moves at a different speed, depending on how high you are, how close to a mass you are, how fast you're going. And essentially the, the, the fact that time moves at a different speed, depending on where you are and how fast you're moving means that there is no single unit of time anywhere in the universe because everywhere is at a different location to the other. So time becomes this the relative relative to your position. So yeah, he breaks down the meaning of time and then kind of reconstructs it using quantum mechanics and, and using thermal time to try to help us understand how and why we understand this time as we live and experience it. Ish. I think, I think it's, yeah, I think it's pretty spot on. So I've got a couple of things. I've got some thoughts and I've got a list of reminders that oh, I yeah. actually, that I actually created that, you know, it was basically like, Hey, the, Hey, Carlo was like, Hey, or this is what we talked about. This is what we tried to run through. And I've actually got a list that we can go through to, to help us with this last chapter. But I, I always write in the margins and um, you know, I, I wrote this in the margin is the flowing of time, just memory showing us one thing at a time. And, you know, I, I started thinking about that and, and this myth of like how our reality is, is rooted. Is it our perception that time is past, present, future flowing in this direction, which we all know that's our internal perception of things, but it, you know, the way that the world works and from a physics perspective, it's, it's quite, quite counter to that. Um, and the, that above statement, the, our reality flows from past, present to future is just an approximation of something more complex. And the reason for that approximation is we only have the ability to process a certain amount of thing. We only have a certain understanding of our language to understand ourselves and our, our position within time. So um, there's my riff. And let's talk about these reminders. The first one you hinted on, the present is localized. What does that mean to you, Mark? I think that's what I said at the beginning. Because time passes at... Should we like have speech marks every time we say time? Because time passes at a different speed, depending on how high you are, how fast you're going, how close to a body of mass you are, it becomes localized to that point. And the time... So normally I live up in the French Alps, in the mountains, a thousand meters above sea level. So my time moves a little bit fractionally slower than you at sea level. And Does that mean you have more time than I do? Yes, fractionally more. <laughs> I mean, if it moves slower, but then if I experience it uh, at my own rate, I have the same amount of time, but who knows? Yes. You should be way more, you, like, should be, you should be way more accomplished than me then. If I should live higher. Me. Like if you want to achieve more, <laughs> why did they never say if you want one of these life hacks, if you want to achieve more, live higher. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And it, so another, another bullet here that I talked Hold about. Hold on. Let me just, let me just read the bit on your question. This is tied, this is tied to this bullet though, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah. A present that is common throughout the whole universe does not exist. Events are not ordered in past, presents and futures. They are only partially ordered. There is a present that is near to us but nothing that is present in a far off galaxy. The present is a localized rather than a global phenomenon. The difference between past and future does not exist in the elementary equations that govern events in the world. Yeah. Yeah. There could be, there, there could be thousands of presents uh, that we're, that we're talking about right now with our thousands of listeners right now, like listening live to us or listening on Spotify their presence are very different than my present and your present, especially if they're listening to it and recorded. But thinking about listening to it live, there is different presence, right? Is this an, like I just thought of a quite sad thought? But you, you know, we live alone, we die alone. But in fact, we're all traveling through this parcel of existence on our own lanes, completely do, like at a separate time to everybody else. Every, we all have our own unique 
passage of time? Well, we, we, we weave in and out. It's, it's, so we talk about, here's actually, let's jump to this one. Like, so well, well, really, really quick before I jump to that, you know, the closer we are to mass, the faster we move, right? Uh, or the closer we are to mass and the faster we move, the more time slows. So in addition to, to, you know, how high or how low you, you are, our proximity to mass and how fast we move affects how, how time passes. But, you know, the, the another one here that I want to jump to is we're in a world of events and not things, right? Events colliding and connecting in very interesting ways, like where you're talking about us as individuals on these like strict little paths, we're in our little tunnels, our tubes, experiencing time in our own way. But there are moments where we intersect with other people and other times, and, and it, it's a series of networked events and not things. Even tables aren't things, even windows aren't things. They're events, but they're just events that have longer duration than a sneeze per se, right? And entropy. Even Almost. a even a rock is merely entropy. The the, the slow decay of the elementary particles that make up the rock. So, as a non scientific per person, yeah, I'm not a I'm not a physicist, a scientist. You aren't either. We're hyper curious individuals that love to investigate <laughs> different disciplines, but. Entropy was really hard for me to get yeah. my head around as it relates to reality. Now, remind me, entropy is the increase in chaos, right? The increase in the, tr the transfer of heat, the transfer of heat, but also the introduction of less predictable things or chaos, which is why yeah. the past has lower entropy, right? And the increase of entropy is actually times arrow, right? There's my damn air quotes again. We got to stop air quoting stuff, but you know, right. So ha have you, have you, um, have you reconciled your relationship with entropy, Mark? Uh, I have, and this book helped me reconcile my, my differences with entropy um, because of how he speaks about, uh, well, I'll, I'll read what he wrote but in our search for time advancing increasingly away from ourselves we have ended up by discovering something about ourselves perhaps just as copernicus by studying the movements of the heavens ended up by understanding how the earth moved beneath his feet perhaps ultimately the emotional dimension of time is not the film of mist that prevents us from apprehending the nature of time objectively perhaps the emotion of time is precisely what time is for us so i have laid the ghost of entropy to bed by by accepting the emotional me the memory of time and uh, as you I think you briefly mentioned memory at the beginning um I, I, yeah i've embraced that definition that understanding of time and entropy can sit there at the back like it's happening great but it's beyond my my pay grade i yeah. That, I remember that was one of the things that we both struggled with getting getting our arms around, and I, I do feel better about it too. And disruptors and curious minds, if you're you know if you're just jumping into this and exp, you know you saw the title of the show today was about uh, you know how to scale your startup, so investors <laughs> will be psyched about it. This is just a first principle of that. We're talking about time, and this is book club, and this is the final episode of the order of time with carlo Ravelli. we got a new book coming up but i like i like your title i'm just going to change the document that we have for the title of the show that you just said there how to scale a tech startup so investors are psyched about it and i'm just going to change that because that's a much better title than what we had yeah being psyched is what was what was the title like what it was something boring like something attract boring. investors <laughs> oh my gosh oh my gosh um well let's continue down this list uh yeah, here's the next. What else you got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right. When I first opened this book, I was like, all right, man. So finally, someone is going to tell me what the hell time is. Like, I was <laughs> like, I was like, yes. I'm like, let's <laughs> dive in. And and obviously that it was definitely not that. But it, it instead of giving me the answer, it got me thinking, which is what really good books do and what is really good writers and good teachers. And that's what, that's what, good versions of those things do. And I, I, one of the things that got me kind of pointed towards something that is kind of concrete as far as time goes is gravitational field as the mechanism 
of time actually proven by equations, I think, right? Like there's some equations that it were listed. The equations themselves weren't listed in the book, but he talked about like the rhythm of time is actually determined by the gravitational field. The gravitational field is um, explained through equations. So there's like logic to time that I was like, oh, okay, maybe I got a little bit of the answer and then super hyper confused on the rest of it. Did that land at all with you? <laughs> I, I'm not getting, I'm not getting in, into that conversation. I have no idea. Um, the book talked about, the book definitely talked about the rhythm of time being determined by gravitational fields. What a see this dark energy, dark matter. What what, what part is that? Yeah, he he mentions gravitational um, fields, and that's it. Seems to be what his life work is really is understanding time through these gravitational fields. And he he Carlo has spent decades doing this, and yeah, that's why we need him on so he can explain more because the, the gravity influence being time time is gravity gravity is time i don't bear yeah. yes i agree with you jeremy i mean it, tr so trust me i still don't understand <laughs> the the mechanics of the gravitational field but being being something that you can point to as as the rhythm of time being rooted in it's interesting and it's probably something that will be parked in my subconscious and you know hopefully i'll dig deeper or someone smarter than me that's listening to this show can comment and direct me towards the next step to learn more on that. That's what this is. These books are just like jump off points and wormholes to, to dig in and learn more about stuff. I'm just looking at if there was um, in this, in chapter 13, if there was a, a brief paragraph on quantum on, on gravity and um, if he summarizes it in any way. So just give me a sec. Um, because he speaks about thermal time. You know, perhaps we belong to a particular subset of the world that interacts with the rest of it in such a way that this entropy is low in what... So, he's, okay, that's entropy again. Ah, hold on. Found it. That the gravitational field has quantum properties is a shared conviction, albeit one currently supported only by theoretical arguments rather than by experimental evidence. The absence of the time variable from the fundamental equations, as discussed in part two, is plausible, but on the form of these equations, debate still rages. The origin of time pertaining to a quantum non-communicative of thermal time and the fact that the increase in entropy which reserve depends on our interaction with the universe ideas that I find fascinating but are far from being confirmed or widely accepted. Whoa. Okay, what sticks with you with that last little piece that you just said? What what sticks with you? Um, are far from being confirmed or widely accepted. Yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't know about a book about time which no one knows the answer to. Yeah. But again, getting you thinking. It gets you thinking about it. It gets you thinking deeper about it than it's just not something that, a wheel that sits on your watch that tells you when the sun comes up and the sun goes down, right? Um, yeah, yeah. What, what, uh, okay. The more we learn, the less we understand. Yeah. So what is time? I sense this book is written. So you can ask yourself, what is time for you? Like what, what is, what is life? What is meaning? And I think this is where you link to clear thinking by, um, the, the chapter on Memento Mori. Is that where you're leading with your? Shane Parrish link. Yeah. Let, so let's bounce to this last chapter, which I think would, let me, let me just make sure I don't have anything on my list that I definitely, that I want to, let's see. Oh, this is all right. So this is, uh, I wrote this down. Um, big, big, big shout out to my wife. Who's in the chat now. Hi, Benny. Hey, what's so up? Thank you. We've got a listener. We've got one. We've got one. We've got one who has her own particular, uh, perspective of time. Her time is different than our time. The more we learn, the less we understand. She liked your, your quote. Awesome. So, all right. So the, the time is the bucket that captures memory and anticipation. So on one half of this, as we construct our reality, it comes from memory, our experiences and that sort of thing. And then on the other side of that, our brain has evolved in such a way that we are masters of anticipation which leads to a lot of things, which leads to 
you know, being worried, being anxious and, and that sort of thing. So going from that last little piece into this last chapter, a quote, our fear of death, speaking of memento mori. Well, yeah. Our fear of death seems to me to be an error of evolution. Our fear of death seems to me to be an error of evolution. So here's, here's how I got my head around it. So back in the day when we were running away from dinosaurs, this whole fight or flight mechanic was awesome. You know, we're, we're, we're trying, trying not to be food. We're trying to find food. Right. And then we hear that rustling behind us. Right. That's when we start sweating and like, you know, heartbeats and all that good stuff. Right. So as our frontal lobe development occurred, right. We, we started uh, thinking about the future and worrying about the future and what, Carlo Ravelli is, as I understand it, what Carlo Ravelli was getting at in this last chapter, these two tendencies have crisscrossed and are now like causing some challenges with us, with, with anxiety and with all of that stuff. So I, I the way I'm tying it to Shane Parrish is we have these biological, biological constructs, these tendencies, what did he call them? Um, it was like had to do with ego. It had to do with our oh, yeah, um, the, yeah, the, yeah, defaults, the, our defaults, the defaults, yeah, all the our defaults, right? So this is one of those defaults that if we understand it better, we actually can move through life a little bit better, which is what he says in the book. And Shane, I would love to unpack all of these defaults <laughs> in massive detail because I was inspired by them. I seem to be quoting them in in everything, <laughs> every conversation I have, but they're really important because if you understand them you can move through the world a little better. So um, I'm going to stop there, Mark. Our fear of death seems to me to be an error of evolution. How does that land for you? Well, he, that, he, he says that that's reason talking. Like it's an evolutionary hiccup. None of the animals don't have it. Like we as humans have it and we shouldn't be scared of death. But then he goes on to say, you know, that's what reason says. But in fact, we are not creatures of reason. We are... and. I keep kept coming back to this creatures that we, memory and, it, and we're afraid of death because of memory and memory seems to be for me inextricably linked to time because every all these conversations is just like memory seems to be the the thing that really me, is time for us a collection of memories and that f- fear of death memento mori um Every day, countless people die, and yet those who remain live as if they were immortal. Yeah, I don't, yeah. So, so another yeah. thing, uh, another thing that I uh, drew some lines around three words that I thought were pretty interesting. Just as, as we, this is more societal, I think, than than scientific or physics based or whatever. But he calls he his three words he used were great collective deliriums great collective deliriums and you know these are these to me are like kind of the mental this the societal constructs that are in place based on our um lack of understanding of complex things right and it and it goes back to like he talked about it in the book the language you know our language that we have to explain really complex things is kind of limited uh, our ability to explain who we are and, and, you know, what we are. Um, I know this is a lot deeper than, you know, time specific, but that's, it's kind of this last chapter has got me thinking a little bit bigger. We are, we know that we are myopic. We barely see just a tiny window of the vast electromagnetic spectrum emitted by things. We do not see the atomic structure of matter, nor the curvature of space. We see a coherent world that we extrapolate from our interaction with the universe, organized in simplistic terms that our devastatingly stupid brain is capable of handling. We think of the world in terms of stones, mountain, clouds, and people. And this is the world for us. Yeah, devastate, devastatingly stupid brain. <laughs> but then he, but he also, he also talks about how brilliant the brain has been to kind of help us navigate some of these things, but acknowledging the limitations. So let's let's talk about from a scientific perspective. This is another thing I wrote down uh, from this last chapter. Is you know when something is unexplainable, there's there's kind of a magic about it, and once it's explainable, it's kind of a scientific truth, right? 
but you know, truths are just memories, right? Truths are like these things that are captured in a moment of time. Um, and we as humans actually have a, have trouble letting those truths evolve because once they're a truth, they become tied to you. Once you believe it is a truth, it's a belief. And Shane Parrish, this is when your defaults come back in, right? It's once I have something that I believe and Mark doesn't believe it, I'm going to defend my belief. So, um, back to magic and back to science. It, it only takes a few centuries for the world to change from devils, angels, and witches to atoms and electromagnetic waves, right? So what what's what's the difference? We've just explained the angels. We've just explained, you know, same experience, different narrative. Wow, dude. Yeah. Um <laughs> and then the song fades and ceases. The silver thread is broken, the gold lantern is shattered, the amphora of the fountain breaks, the bucket falls into the well, the earth returns to dust. And it is fine like this. We can close our eyes, rest. This all seems fair and beautiful to me. This is time. I think that's that's a kind of close to a book that can only be written with the wisdom of age, no? Definitely the wisdom of age, the understanding of the importance of, you know, finding your place in a large, complicated system versus like trying to battle the little intricacies or events within the system. He's looking way above and going, hey, guys, these are the important things. And, you know, I'm, I'm 48. So now, you know, that narrative has been running through my Middle head. Middle age, you're a spring chicken spring chicken with a big gray beard um no it's it's it, it i i completely agree and in, in it in the the importance of time you know or the appreciation of time is actually when you when the supply seems limited right once you're once your supply seems limited or once as my friend says you know if we're lucky you know it's kind of the halftime show right when, when we were like i think he said that when we were like 30 or 35 or 40 right um, now, well beyond the halftime show, maybe, I don't know, who knows, but the limits of what we think might be left tends to make something more valuable, right? Scarcity tends to make you think a little bit differently. I don't know, but beautiful book. He, he starts the book by destructing this idea of time. Time doesn't exist. And, but by the end of the book, time is all we have. Yeah, this, 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 I'm so glad I read this. I'm, I'm definitely thankful that I had my reading buddy, Mark, to help me unpack it because there certainly were chapters in this where I was like, if I was reading it by myself, I'd have, I'd have been like, yo, I need some, I need some help. But, but this was a beautiful book, beautifully written. Um, Carlo, the invite is still open to come uh, spend some time with us and, and talk about it. Uh, we will have our next book picked out figured out in the next week or so mark do we have one we want to announce or i saw i saw a thread about it i'm in if you're in you talk you tell me um let's keep it a secret Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. i don't know do we like I, what thread I, I don't all right so we're gonna we're gonna release the book uh in 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 the coming days or week but uh hopefully you've enjoyed this pivot today i know we don't have a third guest in the box Today was book club gives you a little peek into what we do with book club. If you want to join book club and you want to read this with us, if you want to be a guest and unpack a particular chapter in a book, please go to thinking on paper.xyz. You can sign up uh, for free book club episodes and then you'll get the information exchange back and forth. And if you want to join us for a chapter, your beautiful face will appear in one of these rectangles and we will unpack a chapter in real time awesome yeah couldn't have put it better myself so thank you uh thinking on paper stay disruptive stay curious yeah and keep thinking on your papers Bye. see you next time guys <laughs>